All right, today's the day. Today's the day I finally finished the Ancient Pottery Challenge by making that owl effigy pot. It was almost a year ago when I picked out those seven pots from the Southern Southwest, representing seven different cultures that I was gonna make for the Ancient Pottery Challenge this season. And I've been working through them for the last year, but I've had a long dry spell since the last one, which was the double pot. So I need to get this wrapped up so I can start season five. Here's the original Gila Polychrome Owl Pot that I'll be replicating today. If you hope to follow along with me, here's the tools you're gonna need. A pookie, a gourd scraper, a deer rib, a cutting tool, a smooth stone, a piece of buckskin, and a lump of native clay. This Gila Polychrome Owl Effigy Pot was put off as the last pot in the Ancient Pottery Challenge. Not because it was difficult, but because it was relatively easy for me. You see, Salado Polychromes, of which this is a type, that's my passion. That's really what I most like to be doing this season. I did all Salado Polychromes last season. Uh, and so, really, I could have done this first. I just put it off because it's relatively easy. I wanted to get some of the harder ones out of the way first, so this ended up falling to the last. On the other hand, I had intended to do this in October and I want to get started with the next season. And so uh, at this point, I'm a little behind the curve and I'm, I'm trying to get this knocked out as quickly as possible. So having gotten the base of my pot all set up good in the pookie, I'm ready to start coil building. So I'm just going to use coils to slowly build the pot up from that base. The steps involved in coil building are coil, bond, pinch, Scrape the outside, as I'm doing here, and scrape the inside, as you see me doing here. Now, because this is also not just an owl effigy, but a replica, I'm always conscious of the size. Uh, and so I keep a measuring tape nearby, and I, I'll measure the width as well as the height as I go to make sure I get the size that I want. In this case, I didn't get a chance to measure the original pot. I saw it in a museum display case. And so based on my memory, and the photos I have of the pot. I'm thinking the size is about eight inches wide by about nine inches tall. Uh, I could be off a little bit because like I said, it's just based on memory and photos. So that's what I'm going for, eight by nine. This owl effigy pot is a type of Salado polychrome. And Salado polychrome is really among the most mysterious pottery types in the ancient Southwest for a number of reasons. But one of those reasons is that nobody really knows who the people were that made this type of pottery. So when we look at prehistoric pottery, we can look at Hoakam pottery and you know, we're relatively confident that the Autumn people were the ones making that back in the day. And when we look at some of the prehistoric pottery from up north, for example, uh, the Cibola whitewares that I talked about in one of my recent videos. Those were made by ancestral Zunis. It's pretty obvious. And the Cayenta polychromes that were made up in far northern Arizona, those were made by ancestral Hopis. It's pretty clear in a lot of these types who made it. But with the Salado polychromes, it's really a mystery who these people were. In 1400, when the Salado disappeared, we really have no idea where they went and what happened to them. So I'll talk to you a little more about the Salado and who we think they were later on in this video. Okay, what do we got? About uh, 10 inches high and about nine inches wide. So that's just about right. Cause I decided based on my photos that it was about eight by 10. So I, I think we're real close. I don't know if you know, we're off one way or the other, but that was just an estimate based on a photo. I never measured in person, so uh, I'm, I'm likely way off anyway. So I think it looks about right for the body. Uh, I still have to apply the face, those kind of eyebrow, beak thing, and then a couple of dots for the eyes. But uh, I want to let this firm up a little bit first because uh, it's still pretty wobbly. So I'm going to let it sit here for a little bit, and I'll come back later and put the face on it. The heart of the owl pot is just this little bit of applique on the outside that makes a face. 
and it's really surprising to me how a couple of little coils and some balls of clay really bring the owl to life. Change it from just an ordinary pot into an owl. Looking back at the original pot, I do wish I had made my owl brows a little wider and a little less McDonald's golden arches in shape. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. I mean, I'm okay with the way it came out, but I realized after I did it that um, my brows aren't quite the same shape as the originals. Okay, starting to feel like fall out here. It's a little bit chilly this morning, which is nice for a change because we've had a hot summer. The pot is drawing up nicely, and today my goal is to get the bottom cleaned up uh, there where it's in the pookie, and to get it dry enough that I can add some slip. Now, I may or may not be able to start slipping today, but I'm definitely gonna clean the bottom up right now and then let it dry some and see where we go. So who were the Salado? In the late 1200s, a group of immigrants arrived along the Gila River from an area in far northern Arizona called Cayenta. These Cayenta Anazazis arrived right before Salado polychrome began to be made. And there's a couple of connections between Salado polychrome and Cayenta Anazazi. Some of the designs found on Salado polychrome originated in that Cayenta area. And also, in villages where Salado polychromes were made, they find these perforated plates, these pookies with strange holes in them. And these types of pookies with the holes also originated up in the Cayenta area. So there is some connection between the Cayenta and Salado polychrome. And some archeologists have made the case that Salado was made by Cayenta people. But the case of who were the Salado is not quite so cut and dried. It's a little more complex than that. And there are other areas in the ancient Southwest that also have connections to Salado polychrome. And I'll delve into that more later on in this video. Okay, this should be dry enough to slip now. Something occurred to me last night though. Usually, when I create these round bottom pots, I like to take the bottoms and just, while they're soft, and just, just drop them gently on the table so I'll create a little bit of a flat spot that they'll sit on. And as you see, I didn't think about doing that on this one when it was still damp. And now that it's leather hard, of course, it's too late to do that. But um, usually, when the pot is still a little damp, you can just, just gently kind of drop it on the table a couple times and kind of flatten out the base. And see, this is gonna, this is always gonna be a little bit of a tippy pot because I didn't do that. Oh well, uh, let me get on with the slipping. So what I've got here is my Smectite clay slip from Northern Arizona. I sell this on my website if you're interested in it. This is the special stuff. This is what I call Salado secret sauce. This is the magic ingredient that turns organic paint into black designs. And so if you look at the original picture on this pot, it looks like it's all black and white, but we know that it's Gila polychrome and it's also badly fired. You can see it's, it's pretty dark and sooty and that's why the red areas aren't shining out. But because it's Gila polychrome, we know the bottom was red and also uh, the inner lip just inside the opening and along the rim is probably red as well. So I'm gonna cover all the white areas first with the white slip, just the areas that are white. And then I'll leave those red areas, just the brown you see here. And then once that's had a chance to dry a little bit, the white, I'll go back over it with the red. And then after that, I'll polish the red. Here I'm just making sure the pookie is aligned kind of on the very bottom of the pot. That way I can use it as a template to paint the white slip and leave a circle, a perfect circle at the bottom unslipped. And that is of course where I will put that red slip later on. 
Now this Smectite has an incredibly high shrinkage rate. So you have to make sure you put it on really thin. I usually shoot for two very thin coats. If you put three on or more, you're gonna find a lot of crackling and the slip can even start to come off. Uh, so it's easy to get carried away and, and want to put more on because as you can see, you can see the brown shining through everywhere and you tend to wanna to cover that up. Don't, uh, because as it dries, it will become more opaque. It will become less see-through as it dries. And so uh, you do need to leave that very thin because it has a very high shrinkage rate. And then the red that I have here, this is just a hematite wash. This has no clay in it at all. It's just red ochre mixed with water. And so I apply this on while the pot is still leather hard. And then there's nothing to hold it in place because like I said, there's no clay. So then all of that red has to be gone over with a smooth stone. And because the pot is still damp, when you do that, you're pressing those particles of hematite into that still damp clay. So now I'll flip it over and do the same on the bottom. And then when you first apply the stone, you need to make sure it's at the right stage of dryness. Just gently, gently, gently go over it. And if the red is sticking to your stone, then you're still too wet. Uh, if the red isn't sticking to your stone, then get started. And you have to be careful that you don't smear it into the white. So it's almost like coloring in the lines there. I store my organic paint dry, so it's good to plan ahead of time before you're gonna paint, maybe an hour or two, and add some distilled water to your organic paint so it can rehydrate and be ready to paint when you need it. And because I store it in this open container, when I'm done using it, it just naturally dries, which is a great way to store it. Okay, after a couple days of drying, this pot is ready to start painting. Hopefully I can get this all painted today so that I can take it out and fire it tomorrow. We'll see how that works out. I've got my paint all ready to go. And today I'm using commercial brushes just because I'm in a little bit of a hurry, a little bit of a time crunch on the video release schedule. So I'm not gonna be using yucca brushes or naturally made brushes this time. So I'm gonna get started on the painting and we'll see how it goes. The consistency of organic paint you're looking for is liquid enough that it soaks into the slip, but not so thin that it runs easily. This is why we paint organic paint onto bone dry pottery because a bone dry pot is better at absorbing that liquid organic paint. In fact, it even helps if the pot's a little warm. Sometimes I'll set it out in the sun or even in my oven to warm up the pot before I paint it. That way that organic paint gets drawn down into the slip better. Speaking of organic paint, organic paint is one of the things that connects Salata Polychrome with other areas of the ancient Southwest. When Salata Polychrome first started being manufactured along the Gila River in about 1300, organic paint was unheard of in this area. It was never practiced in the Southern Southwest. It was only something that had been made previous to this in the Northern Southwest. And so again, we go back to those Cayenta immigrants who had just arrived just previous to Salado being made. And it turns out they made organic painted pottery in their homeland. So people have made that connection saying that Salado Polychrome must have been made by those Cayenta immigrants because they made organic painted pottery. The problem is that the organic painted pottery that the Cayenta had made in their homeland was not like this. It was technologically different. It was reduction fired organic painted pottery. It was the kind that's fired in a big trench kiln and then smothered. Whereas Salado Polychrome is a different technology. It's oxidized organic painted pottery. This technology didn't come from Cayenta at all, but originated with Mogollon peoples living along the Puerco River near current day Petrified Forest National Park. So that connects Salado Polychrome with a second completely different group of people, the Mogollon culture. Now, there's also connections with a third group. You see, Salata Polychrome shares design elements with Cibola Whiteware and White Mountain Redware, which is a Cibola tradition, another different branch of ancestral Puebloans. So with connections to three different distinct cultural groups in the Northern Southwest, it's anybody's guess who the Salata were and where their descendants live today.
This morning I'm firing two pots. I have my owl pot and I have a little test pookie here that I'm just testing out some different slips and paint applications. First thing you have to do is just preheat the pottery. Just get it warm all over to drive out any remaining moisture that might be in it. And I've dug a little shallow pit here today. Usually I fire these right on the surface, but I'm a little concerned because of the height of the owl pot that I get a good all over firing and get the right atmosphere and all of it. Uh, I like to get my firewood pre-cut to the right lengths and kind of sort it by size. That'll make it easier when I go to stack it. A successful Salado polychrome firing is all about the size and amount of wood put around the pottery. So you want just the right amount of flame. You don't want to over fire it. You also don't want to under fire it. You want that fire to burn out within maybe 15 or 20 minutes. So you don't want too big of wood. You want it smaller than your wrist. By the time the fuel burns away to this stage, you're really not doing anything. The pot's already cooled below the point where you're making ceramic or doing anything positive. The only thing those flames could potentially do at that point is to put more carbon on your pot. So you're better off to kind of rake them back and get them out of the way. Okay, I think it came out really good. Uh, it's all cooled off now. And what you see on here, a lot of this is ash. So when you paint organic paint on it, uh, after you fire it, it leaves a layer of ash. You can wipe that off. And you can see I have, I have reasonably good blacks underneath that ash. So once I take this home and clean it up, uh, it'll look a lot better. You can see these areas here where I've wiped. Uh, it's a lot nicer black on white looking. Um, I've got a couple of pops on here, uh, places where something in my temper caused uh, a little pop out during the firing. One right here by the face you can see, and uh, so you know those detract a little bit. How this differs from the original, once I got painting I really looked at it in a lot more detail than I had previously and I noticed that uh, in the pictures you can see that on the original the back kind of slopes away. So the face is actually higher and the back kind of slopes down. Uh, but you know, that doesn't bother me that it's not that way because I think that kind of looks bad. I think it looks better with an even rim. So I'm not above trying to improve the ancient pots if I think they're kind of messed up. Also, I didn't know what the design was on the back uh, because I didn't have a picture from the back. So I could see kind of the side a little bit here. And from that, I just kind of extrapolated, you know, that I was putting in these panels, these vertical panels. I think that worked out really good. And, and that's how you have to do it. If you don't have a lot of good pictures, you just have to make up what you think might've been there. And that's good enough. The same with the size. Um, I didn't have a measurement. I looked at that picture really close and I kind of guessed on the size. Uh, I could be, I could be way off. Uh, but I think having seen it in person, never held it, but seen it, I've been to the museum and seen it. Uh, I think this is pretty close to the size it was. Uh, you can hear it rings really good. So uh, I got a good firing. And like I said, we got good organic blacks, which is really the key when you're doing these Salado polychromes. Getting good organic blacks is really uh, the tricky part of making these. Now don't go away yet, I'm not done. I'm gonna take this back to my studio and we're gonna look at all the Ancient Pottery Challenge pots together. We're gonna talk about how the Ancient Pottery Challenge went. We're gonna talk a little bit about next season. So let's go back to the studio now and do that. All right, so there it is. The entire body of season four's Ancient Pottery Challenge in one place, all seven pots. I'm really proud of this collection this year, uh, not only because I think you know I did pretty well, but because my love, my passion is really 
for the prehistoric pottery of the southern southwest specifically. And this collection really represents the ancient pottery of the southern southwest. Seven different cultures representing seven different distinct pottery types that were made here in ancient times. The Desert Mogion, the Membrus Mogion, the Ornata Mogion, Hoocom, Casas Grandes, Cayenta, and Salado. Uh, and I've gone out of my way to get all the right native materials to make it with and to make them authentically and fire them authentically. So uh, although there were a lot of mistakes made and there was a lot of things that could have been done better, overall, uh, it's a very nice body of work that I'm really proud of. Now let's talk just a little about the Ancient Pottery Challenge. I've done it uh, twice before. Well, this time and one other time. And I encouraged others to make these pots. And as I said in a recent video, I was very disappointed in the amount of participation in this particular challenge. There were a handful of my viewers who made some of these pots, but overall the participation was very slim. So I made a video asking what you thought. Uh, I did some polling on my channel. I asked questions of people that watched my videos and I've got a good idea of what's going on here. What I'm finding is that a lot of people that watch my videos, they're watching it to learn how to make this kind of pottery. And a lot of those people feel like they're not up to snuff to take on a challenge of this magnitude. A lot of other people that watch my videos though, probably over half of the people that watch them, aren't even interested in doing pottery. They just enjoy watching. So, uh, you know, just like I watch channels that I don't do, right? I watch channels where they repair shoes. Uh, I watch channels where they do all sorts of different arts and crafts that I'm not interested in participating in. So I, I really understand. So the Ancient Pottery Challenge was to get participation, but in the eyes of most of my viewers, they just wanted to watch me make them. So I am going to do it again next season in season five. Uh, this is the end of season four here because the challenge is kind of the, the structure, the bones of the season. So I'm done with season four at this point. And next season, I'm going to do another challenge but I'm not gonna emphasize so much participation. If you wanna participate, go ahead and make one of the pots and put it up on Instagram with the hashtag Ancient Pottery Challenge and I will share them on this channel. But if you're not interested, that's okay too. I'm not gonna make a big deal out of it. Uh, I'm not going to expect it. I'm going to be pleasantly surprised when somebody does participate. And so because I did the Southern Southwest this season, I have to, in order to give it due credit, I have to do the Northern Southwest next season. So, and because I did seven, and I know, you know, it took me right up to the bitter end to get all seven done. But because I did seven in the Southern Southwest, in order to give the Northern Southwest its rightful due, I'm going to do seven different pottery types from the Northern Southwest next season. And a lot of the pottery in the Northern Southwest is black on white. So uh, it may not be as colorful as this season, uh, but it will definitely be at least as challenging and hopefully entertaining to watch. So beginning with the next video, I will be telling you about those seven types that I'm making and how we're gonna do that for season five of Ancient Pottery. All right, I appreciate you coming with me today. I'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching.